don't get them, I don't know what we'll do, but we'll know in hopefully in a couple of hours whether or not they're in our passports or not. I think it's like all these things to do with borders and passports and visas. It's better that we put the cameras away. Just keep low profile. Do to park in there? <coughs> the Iranian embassy in uh, Bakum and uh, it seems to be chaotic. You're not even letting people in, everyone's queued up, queuing up on the street. We've now been told that, that we have to go to the bank to pay for the visas and then go back to the Iranian embassy to get our visas. But the problem is it closes at 11 o'clock and it's 10.30 now. We're taking a taxi to the bank because we're under terrible time pressure. Should ask the taxi I can't see. This isn't going to happen, is it? We've got 20 minutes to try and get to the bank. It's going to be tight. I'm going to go back up there and try and keep the door open as long as I can until these guys come back with the receipt. <laughs> Time is not on our side. Who did he just get off the phone to? I've just been talking to the Iranian government in Tehran to try and persuade them to call the embassy in Baku to keep it open for a few more minutes. I mean, what, what happens if they don't get these visas? Doesn't get the visas today. Tomorrow's a public holiday in Azerbaijan, and then it's the weekend, so we'll be off schedule by three days. Iran is a complete unknown quantity, so we don't know how long it's going to take them to get through there, and potentially they're going to miss their boat to India. We've got these slips, which tell us that we paid for our visas, and uh, Russia's signatures had to be signed by somebody else. I'm trying to film this discreetly because uh, we don't want to create any undue uh, attention to ourselves. But all of our paperwork is now in. It's uh, just past half past 11. Um, and uh, we're now waiting out the front to see if, if our visa will get stamped. We've got the passports. Look at this. Look at that. That's what we've been spending all day trying to get. So, woohoo! We're going to Iran. I was a bit mad today. We're driving down to the Iranian border in this thing. But the, we can't get all so the bags in this thing, so we've got this. We've got this, which is an old Fergan, which actually we used in Long Way Round. Well, it's a nice car. Look, come and have a look around it. We used to see loads of these in Mongolia and well, anywhere in ex-Soviet countries. They're just good fun and they're kind of just mad. Look, I mean, it's this one has actually been converted. It's got a BMW M5 engine. <laughs> it's an old belt. You just sort of hook it up. Russians can make fantastic tanks, weapons and stuff like that, but when it came to cars... <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. You've got to push so far down on the pedal to, to get any kind of brick. I'm not convinced about this. <laughs> On our way to Iran, um, as we were coming out of Baku, it's one of the oldest places that has been producing oil, and they've got all these nodding donkeys everywhere, and they're famous for it. So I wanted to go and have a look at that. They produce 1.2 million barrels of oil a day, which gives the government about $6.3 billion a year. Well, let's have a look at this, this, look at this oil here. It is one of the most polluted cities in the world, if not the most polluted city in the world. It's, it's not a good environment. If you had scratched a sniff TV, you could smell the oil. It's like sort of tarry. Does he work for a, for a company who are doing this? This is a company called Nishtir, yeah? Yeah, he's for a state oil company. They, are they good to him, or does he, is it good pay? Nishtir is sort of that. 200, yeah. 200 dollars. <laughs> Approximately 200 dollars salary. So, Ten dollars a month to do this. And so someone's making a lot of money. But look, here, this is all crude oil. Filthy when these guys were just completely covered in oil. Hard work to do. And out of all that open and that horrible oil and covered in all day long. It's a hard life. And then to be paid only ten dollars pounds a month. As we're heading out of the oil fields on this Uraz, 
uh, the brakes started to fail and go completely spongy. So we had to get rid of that. Well, I think that's that one, really. Fortunately, our interpreter found us a beautiful 1956 Soviet-built Russian Volga for us to carry on in the journey. Beautiful, huh? Come and have a look inside. BMW dashboard. Ah, OK, it's not so far over. The Volga was the sort of Rolls-Royce of the Russian cars. It was basically the most expensive car that a Russian could own. We're at the Iranian border now, so fingers crossed we'll get through OK, but uh, we'll see what happens. So, so yeah, what's happening? Well, uh, we've got our visas. We've got one visa, an Azerbaijan visa and one passport, and um, the uh, Iranian visa and another passport, and that seems to be, seems to be a problem. But we don't know what's happening now. So I've just gone in there. So Mungo and I are waiting here just to see if, um, if it happens or not. There's a lot of stamping going on in there, but I'm typing furiously. I always feel really nervous on a border because you just, you end up with no power. They could do anything you want. They take your passport away and you're buggered, you know? And until you get that passport back, uh, you just never quite know what's going on. Iran was a breeze. I mean, I think we were in and out in about three minutes. We're going to hop on this thing, which they all use to drive stuff around. Yeah, OK. He's saying you've got to be very careful about the steering, because it can tip over really fast. Just thinking about how lucky I am, really, to, to be on this trip and to it's be good. able to experience all these different forms of transport and, and the people, like that guy on that little tuk-tuk that we drove, and he was a wrestler. He didn't quite make it as a wrestler, so he's bought this little machine for a couple of thousand dollars. And he now sort of makes his living doing that. <laughs> Win around. That's amazing. And it seems a lovely place. And as usual, people are just people. And uh, people seem really kind and nice. And, and uh, you know, that's what you normally see around the world, really. Only the politicians that make it difficult. This little Lajva only <laughs> does about 30 miles an hour. So we thought we've got quite a long way. So we thought we'd better find another form of transport to get us on. When you and I were going down through Africa, I remembered that uh, you know, the best places to stop are where bus drivers and truck drivers stop, because that's usually where the good food is. And so we'd stopped at this place and uh, started chatting to these to these truck drivers. They're happy for us to come with them in the in, in the truck. Miguel, no problem. We want to stay in the truck. No. Okay. Thank you. Okay. This is what you sort of dream about when you're a little boy, don't you? Yeah. Sort of coming along on this truck. It's an amazing vehicle. Incredible. I wonder how many miles this has done, how many kilometers. More than a million kilometers. More than a million kilometers. Wow, that is fantastic. He sits in that truck and just drives all day, every day. Sometimes he's off for 20 days, he'll go 10 days up to somewhere and come back and he'll do fruit and veg, cement, whatever, whatever he can get, really. It was really nice to see that. I, I liked him a lot, I must say. I, I did like him a lot. Iran's an interesting place. You know, the, the northern part is, is completely covered in green and vegetation, and they grow rice, and they do all this kind of stuff. And then you pop through this tunnel and through this pass, uh, and you pop out the other side, and it's desert. And since, since then, you know, Tehran is smack in the middle of the desert. It's hot.
he was so relaxed and chilled out and, and, and he was just happy to have a long... This is what this whole trip by any means is all about, is just meeting people like that and just having just a moment of their lives.